Welcome to the 36th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. So, Russell, some of the announcements that we wanted to start off, I wanted to thank uh, some of the people on Facebook that have sent us some really cool stuff. First, we got, how do you say his name? I always kill it. I believe it's Elaine LeClerc. Elaine LeClerc. He sent us a bunch of video on uh, the Baston, how do you say it? Baston? Baston parade, you know, where they're bringing in like the Shermans and some of the other tanks and driving through uh, Baston. And uh, that was very cool. Yes. We'll appreciate that. And uh, then Alex Martinez sent us some video uh, on the Panzer IV. It was at the Flight Museum in Painfield. So, you know, Panzer IV, very yes, cool. Yes, yes. Very like that very much. We have to give a special sh- shout out to uh, Tony. How do you say Tony's name? Thielen. Thielen. Tony Thielen. It, Tony, thank you so much for making the Christmas videos and the new tank, two tankers and a cat emblems. And what do you call those things? Just art. Banner. Yeah. yeah the banners. banner for our Facebook page. Uh, Tony, we want you to know we appreciate it, brother. We really do. We really do. We, yeah. Thanks for taking the time out to do that for us. It means a lot to us. Okay, Russ. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of points, but I think the first point we're going to bring up is a very rare known tank, uh, the Tetriarch. So, okay, Russ, let's start the show and uh, tell me about this t- Tetriarch. Yeah, the light tank, MK7 also known as the Tetrarch, was a British light tank produced by Vickers Armstrong in the late 1930s and deployed during the Second World War. The Tetrarch was originally designed as the latest in the line of light tanks built by the company for the British Army. It improved upon its predecessor, the Mark 6B light tank, by introducing the extra firepower of a two-pounder gun. The war office ordered 70 tanks, an order that eventually increased to 220. Production was delayed by several factors, and as a consequence, only 100 to 177 of the tanks were produced. Light tanks were actually designed to scout enemy positions and act as policing vehicles for occupational forces, and as such, they consisted of minimal armor and usually were only armed with machine guns. Okay, So I was listening to you. So there's no definite record of how many were built. According to war office documentation, 100 tanks were given registration numbers. Other sources place the number as high as 177, but this number has not been proven in official documents. Okay, so they don't know how many they built. They lost track. Uh, Well, you know what? During the bombing and stuff, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that some documentation was lost. Uh, You said that Tetriarch was delayed. Why, Why was that delayed? After the Battle of Dunkirk, British tank production began to focus on infantry and cruiser tanks and phasing out Light tanks. Vickers production slowed due to a transfer of the Mark 7 from the planet Ellswick, Newcastle, to the Metro Camel factory in Birmingham in mid-1940. This was further exacerbated by Luftwaffe raids, which resulted in damaged supply lines and also by the vehicle's design flaws, such as a faulty cooling system. That makes sense. So it got delayed because they had to change factories, and the Luftwaffe was doing their, you know, bombing and the Battle of Berlin w- was going on, or a uh, Battle of um, Britain was going on, yeah. the air battle. Well, Russ, you know in our game, World of Tanks, the Tetriarch is a Soviet ve- vehicle, so that must be a Lin lease. Explain that. In June 1941, due to the start of Operation Barbarossa, the USSR was added to Britain's Lend-Lease program. While the Lend-Lease was originally started as a method for the United States to provide aid, the British government also participated in giving aid and planned to send a fraction of the produced Tetrarch to the USSR. Okay, Russ, so the British sees that the American Lend-Lease program is a good deal. So they're like, okay, the Soviets are taking a br- lot of brunt, and I don't want to debate this. I'm just saying that the German forces were making big pushes into the USSR, and a l- lot of the most fierce, just terrible battles that broke out were between the Axis troops against the USSR or the Eastern Front. If I had my choice to go to the Eastern or Western Front, it, of course, you know, I'm going to the Western Front. You know, the Eastern Front, you know, I'm not trying to say the Soviets were great or, or the Germans were great. I'm saying if you study 
the battles, they were terrible. They were bloody. Uh, I'm sorry, Russ, go ahead. 20 tanks were delivered on the 27th of December in 1941 to Zanjan, Iran, but no further deliveries were made. After crews were trained in their use, the tanks were transferred to the 151st Tank Brigade and were used alongside the Soviet T-26. They fit into Soviet tank doctrine, who still use light tanks for scouting and combat roles, and eventually they saw combat when the 151st Tank Brigade was under the command of the 47th Army on the Transcaucasian Front. During fighting near the Aben River on January 27th of 1943, the 151st experienced 15 bailouts, which is the crew actually abandoning the tank after it was hit in their attempt to take a hill. So they sent 20 of these tanks, right, mm-hmm. to Iran. They picked them up, got them over there, and they fit into their doctrine. They're like, okay, yeah, we're actually going to use these tanks. And 15 of these tanks were hit, and they had bailouts. You know what? You got to like a tank that you can get out of quick, you know? Very true. By January 31st, only 14 tanks were still operational. And on the next day of fighting, another six were lost. Even after recovery efforts, on the 1st of February 1943, the 47th Army had only nine working tetrarchs, and by May, only seven remained running. Due to a lack of spare materials for repairs, the number continued to dwindle as the remaining tanks were transferred to the 132nd Tank Regiment in the 5th Guards Tank Brigade. By September, only two tetrarchs remained, and they were retired in the autumn of 1943. So they took these tanks that the British gave them and they're like, hey, we're going to use them until we can't use them anymore. They liked them. And, you know, just wow. I know. You know? Okay, Russ, let's get to my favorite part, the stats. Yeah, the Tetrarchs were designed by Vickers Armstrong, designed in 1938, and it was manufactured by the Metro Camel produced between 1938 and 1942. And like we talked about, there was, depending on whose record you look at, they built between 100 and 177 of them. That's still weird to me that they I don't know. have the exact numbers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If anybody out, th- out there runs across any uh, grandpa or great grandpa's you know, uh, stuff and finds out the exact number of them, Please forward that information yeah. to us. Yeah, the number that was built, yeah. The Tetrarchs weighed about 16,800 pounds, or 7,600 kilograms. They were 13 foot 6 inches long, or 4.11 meters. They were 7 foot 7 inches wide, or about 2.31 meters wide. And they were 6 foot 11 inches high, or 2.12 meters. So, small tank, but yeah. what, what about the crew? What, what kind of crew are we talking about? Yeah, the Tetrarchs had a crew of three. It had a commander, a gunner, and a driver, which is probably about all that could fit in the thing. Yeah, pretty small tank. And it had a maximum armor of about 14 millimeters. Oh, okay. But we, you know, when we talked about the Christie tank, it had like one inch or one millimeter armor. At least it'll stop small arms fire. It had a main armament of a QF two pounder which is 40 millimeters, and it carried about 50 rounds of that inside the tank with them. The Tetrarch CS, or Close Support, was an infantry fire support variant fitted with a 3-inch or 76 millimeter howitzer. Okay, so they made some of these tanks with the 3-inch or 76 millimeter howitzer. I I would take that one over the 2 pounder. Yeah, I agree. What are we talking about secondary armament? The secondary armament consisted of a 7.92 millimeter BESA machine gun, and they carried about a little over 2,000 rounds of that with them. It's got a gun. You know, uh, the you know the close support had the three inch yeah. howitzer mm-hmm. and, and a machine gun. Uh, okay, and it's quick. I, I imagine. Oh well, yeah, it had a Meadows twelve cylinder petrol one hundred sixty five horsepower engine. It had a coil spring suspension. The operational range was about one hundred forty miles or two hundred thirty kilometers, and its speed was about forty miles per hour or sixty four kilometers per hour. And off road, it could do about twenty eight miles per hour or forty five kilometers per hour. Wow, you know, forty miles an hour going down the you know, smooth road—that's really good speed. Pretty good for a World War II vehicle. Yeah, and, and even off road running through there, twenty-eight. Uh, you know, and I know on a track vehicle at twenty-eight miles oh, an hour, yeah. you're getting beat to death. Oh yeah, it'd be a rough ride. But uh, uh, 
they were using this thing, you know, in combat and everything yeah. else. Okay, Russ, I think, you know, like I said, I'd take the CS Tetriarch over everything else. And you told us a little bit about its combat history in the Soviet theater. But let's get to our second point, And I believe that's Operation Ironclad. Now, this is an operation I had no knowledge of. And we're asking you again, why don't you guys... Crack a book, you know, do your own research, because Russ and I will be the first one to tell you, do your own research. Exactly. You know, we're just lightly touching these, and the history of this stuff is amazing. Uh, Russell, tell us about Operation Ironclad. Operation Ironclad was the invasion of Madagascar, and that was the third largest island in the world, and it was then under the Vichy French control. Okay, so Madagascar is an island on the... East side of South Africa. So if you guys are looking at your world map, you look for Africa, the very bottom, South Africa, and you'll look over and you'll see this huge island. And like they said, that's the third largest island in the world, right? True. Madagascar. Yes. And it was controlled by the Vichy or Vichy French. When we say Vichy French, that is when Germany took over France and basically set up their puppet government in France. That was basically the German-run French group. The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, decided that Madagascar should be occupied as rapidly as possible to deny the port of Anserain to Japanese naval forces, which had recently advanced into the Indian Ocean and was currently controlled by the Vichy French. Like we said, the Vichy French or French had control of Madagascar. The Japanese were part of the Axis troops or alliance, and they would move in to the Indian Ocean. They they could use Madagascar as a refueling, uh, food, just a great base to you know continue attacking everything in the Indian Ocean. They need to take this, right? Sure, they do. Operation Ironclad was under the command of Major General Robert G. Sturgis, and under his command was B Special Service Squadron, created by merging six Valentine's tanks and six Tetrarch tanks from different squadrons into a single unit. So basically, they came up with this uh, B Special Service Squadron. Basically, they're looking for tanks that are operational and then they can use. So they start scraping the bottom of the barrel and they come up with six Valentines and six Tetriarchs and say, okay, now go take the third largest island in the world. Wow. Okay, so uh, Major General Robert uh, Sturgis, our hats off to you, bud. Exactly. <laughs> you, you had six tanks yeah. that they were just kind of sitting around not using, and they're like, okay, go for it, buddy. At least he had a plan. The invasion force assembled off the west coast of the northern tip of Madagascar on May 4th near Ansaring. The landing began at 0430 on May 5th, and the objective of the brigades and their armored support was to take control of Ansarain and a nearby town. Here, the invasion force encountered the first French defenses, and that consisted of camouflage trenches and pillboxes dug in along a ridge. The tanks attempted to breach them, but the rocky ground made maneuvering difficult, and they could not close with the pillboxes and trenches. They engaged a number of targets with two-pounder and machine gun fire, but the line had to be cleared by an infantry assault later in the day. So they weren't real effective, and they had to use the grand ground forces to take the ridge. So here's all these, you know, troops going, oh man, thank goodness the tanks are here. Boy, they're going to get up there. And it's all loose rock and and big rocks and and they just can't get up there. And they they fire their little two-pounders at it, machine gun them. And they're like, guys, we can't get up there. You're going to have to go. Thus again, proving the tanks cannot do everything that the infantry can do. Yeah. Uh, What happened then, Russ? The tanks were ordered to outflank the defenses and advance further into the island. The small force continued to advance until it encountered the Vichy French main line of defense. And this actually included camouflage pillboxes, machine gun nests, and a dug-in 75mm artillery piece, which could penetrate the armor of both the Tetrarchs and the Valentines. The two Valentines advanced first, but were knocked out by artillery fire, and the two Tetrarchs that were moving behind them suffered the same fate. So they had 12 tanks, and now they've lost four. Yeah. Uh, What happened? They retreated in order to report on the French resistance. Uh, The commander of the tanks made this report and was then ordered to take command of four Valentines and two Tetrarchs 
and once again attempted to breach the French defenses. He he loses four tanks and he comes back and he goes, hey, listen, I've lost four tanks. And they're like, you know, you're, you're going to have to take it. You're going to have to go back and try to take it. What happened? The tanks followed the road leading to the defensive line and then attempted to outflank the line by advancing from the right-hand side using several hills as cover. The enemy artillery pieces were able to turn and face the assault, however, and one Valentine and one Tetrarch were hit and destroyed. So now he's lost another two tanks. So he's getting up there and he goes, well, I know I can't hit him straight straight on. I've lost four. So we're going to try to go the right flank and, you know, catch him on the side. And he loses another two. The remaining tanks exchanged several volleys of fire with the artillery pieces before retreating back to their original positions. The remaining tanks of B Squadron, two Valentines and three Tetrarchs, remained in defensive positions until the afternoon of May 6th, coming under sporadic artillery fire, which disabled another Valentine. They they start shooting at the artillery pieces. They were firing back, and he's like, you know what, we can't do it. We can't do it. Um, we don't have enough oomph. And uh, they backed off to their original starting spots, and the artillery knocks out another Valentine. The squadron played no further part in the battle as the Vichy French authorities negotiated a formal surrender the following day. The squadron suffered heavy casualties during the invasion. Only one Valentine and three Tetrarchs out of 12 tanks were functional by May 7th. Those were actually remained in Madagascar until early 1943 when they were shipped to India to take part in the Burma campaign as part of the 29th Brigade. They sent these tanks out, they get knocked out, and they back off, and they're like, okay, you're going to stay here for the rest of the war, or, you know, till the Burma campaign. But the next day, the French surrendered. Huh, French surrendering. That, I know. That's new, isn't I it? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm kidding. We're, we're, we're kidding. We love our French viewers. Yes. We, at no point are we making fun. Nope. But uh, the, the, they did surrender. What a great episode. And as always, we suggest that you, you know, crack a book. Uh, we are here to get you interested about tanks and their history. At no point are we going to carry you into, you know, tank history. There are so many great links. Tank Encyclopedia. Yeah. Um, There's so many books like Francis Pullman's book uh, or books. He's got a bunch. Um, I'm still talking about Francis uh, getting one of his autographed copies so we can send that out to our listeners do you know we're at eleven thousand downloads on just on podbean i know it's it's incredible and we had no idea when we started this no and every every week it's getting bigger and bigger and it is just incredible and it's all thanks to you guys it is it is and if you guys do find books and stuff like on these campaigns and stuff like that share it with us we love we love to hear it yes or if you have a tank that you want us to do we'll do it all right um it's pretty much the closing of the show but let's give our patreons a shout out yeah our patrons on patreon andy crow Thank you, Andy. We've still got Born Ben. He's still supporting us. Uh, Christy McCarty, and Kevin Shin, very cool. And Kyler Montgomery, Mark Drake, and we've still got ODS Thero. And everybody's favorite, Rick Schmidt. Yep. <laughs> You'll have to watch my stream when Rick's on, because Rick's usually three or four drinks into the show, <laughs> and we have a drinking game for mine. Every time I get hit by artillery, everybody has to take a drink. Oh, no. Uh, Within an hour, everybody's like, uh, I got to go to bed. I can't feel my feet. <laughs> wow. Um, we appreciate everybody. Um, we do. We, we do ask. Uh, and I hate asking for money. We are in our new studio. There's some other stuff that we want to do. Uh, we want to improve our video equipment. Yeah. So if you're thinking about being an, a Patreon user, it's really simple. Yeah. It's, it's not tough. And w- I think you can join us for two bucks. Two bucks. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lousy two bucks isn't going to break you. Nope. And, we, you know, anybody that wants to sign in, we're going to give you shout outs and, yeah. you know, like we do. But it, it's yeah. gotten to the point right, right now uh, we're thinking about uh, doing the uh, some stuff with Patreon, yes. uh, some stuff with YouTube. We do need your support. Uh, please, if you're like, well, they've been on a year and they keep going strong. They keep growing. Maybe I should throw a couple of bucks. 
you know, or I listen to them every episode, maybe, you know, yeah. uh, throw them a couple of bucks. It's appreciated. Yes. And we are using it. Yes. Uh, and we do have some neat things coming. Um, still planning in the planning stages, but one of the biggest things will be bringing some interviews. Yeah. We've got a ton of interviews lined yes. up. We actually have somebody now that's going to help us out uh, yes. with uh, Skype. Yes. And how to record it and uh, our Patreon stuff. So I know we haven't done any Patreon stuff. So we sent Russell down to do uh, some drone footage of an M60 tank. That's Where's that located? In Oswego, Kansas. You have to look that one up on the map. Yeah. yeah. It's a little town here in southeast Kansas. And they've got a M60 in their city park. So definitely it's worth going being a pa- Patreon and catching up on all the stuff that you've missed there. Especially for two bucks. Yeah, you know. I know. If you want to don- donate more, you, you, high five. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. Exactly. But if you want to see some of the drone footage that we've got, we've got one of the Sherman tank. And now we've got the M60 coming up. It, it, it's it's time for you to, you know, join the bandwagon. It is. All right. Well, great show, Russ. Yeah, it was. All very, right. Very, very good. Well, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. As always, happy tanking. And have a great week.